Tonight's reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 52. That's Mark 10, 32 to 52. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprung up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Uh, We're going to look at just one verse from God's word in order to encourage and direct us at the beginning of 2021. Uh, The verse I've chosen for this purpose is verse 45 of our reading. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It is deservedly a very well-known verse. Many of us here will be familiar with it from previous years in RML Mark, and those of us doing Mark this year can look forward to studying it later in term. It also happens to be an appropriate verse for this time of year. We've all spent the last month thinking about the arrival of the Lord Jesus, but this verse tells us in Jesus' own words why he came. Most importantly, though, It is a great verse, as I've called it in the title, a text to treasure. It comes at the end of the central section of Mark's gospel, which describes Jesus' journey from the sphere of his earthly ministry in Galilee to the scene of his crucifixion in Jerusalem. The section runs from chapter 8, verse 31, all the way to to the end of chapter 10, and is structured around three predictions of Jesus' death and resurrection. 
The first in chapter 8, verse 31. The second in chapter 9, verse 31. And the third and final in chapter 10, verse 33 and 34. In each prediction, Jesus teaches his disciples about the necessity of his death and also about their need to follow him in costly service. Throughout the section, the disciples have repeatedly failed to grasp either point. They can't understand why Jesus has to die. And rather than serving one another, they jostle behind him for status and position. A little bit earlier on in our reading, two of them, James and John, had come to him asking to have the best seats in the house at his left and right-hand side in glory, reserved for themselves. They still don't get it. But in our verse, both of their errors are tackled head on. We're told why Jesus has to die in order to give his life as a ransom for many. And we're told why his disciples have to follow him. For even the Son of Man came not to be served. This verse, then, is the climactic summary of Jesus' teaching about the cross in Mark's gospel. And therefore, I think the ideal place for us to be at the beginning of the year. After all, it has been rather grim in 2020, hasn't it? And so what better place to turn to as we look for some refuge, some solid ground in the midst of all the chaos than the cross? of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what better place to look, what better encouragement as we set out on another year of ministry than the remarkable reality of the crucified King. I don't know how your Christmas holiday went. It might just have been a very difficult time. Spiritually, I know the holidays can be tough, And maybe you were on your own at Christmas for the first time. Well, I hope this verse will encourage you. It might be that you're feeling weary after months and months on Zoom. Indeed, I'm almost certain that you are. Well, I hope this verse will refresh you. Or maybe you just need reminding at the beginning of another new year of what the Lord Jesus is really all about. Well, I hope this verse will help you to reaffix your gaze on him. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the rest of our time together, I want us to meditate over three precious treasures from this verse. Three precious treasures the precious condescension of the cross, the precious accomplishment of the cross, and the precious accessibility of the cross. And so firstly, the precious condescension of the cross, for even the Son of Man came not to be served. The title, Son of Man, occurs 13 times in the Gospel of Mark, always on the lips of Jesus and always speaking about himself. In the early stages of the book, it mostly refers to Jesus' authority. In chapter 2, verse 10, he told the scribes, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. But the title's importance as a sign of Jesus' authority flows out of its most basic significance as the title of God's final, end-of-time, eschatological judge. The Son of Man is the figure appointed by God to come at the end of history and to execute his judgment on all people. At several points in the gospel, Jesus describes his coming on the clouds of heaven. In chapter 13, verse 26, he tells the disciples, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he tells the high priest in chapter 14 that he will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand in power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now that reference to the clouds of heaven should remind us of Daniel chapter 7, where the prophet sees a figure like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and being given dominion and glory and a kingdom. 
His kingdom will be a universal kingdom. It is given that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, which means that it includes every single one of us here this evening. And it will be an eternal kingdom. His dominion will be an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. When Jesus calls himself the Son of Man then, he is claiming to be this divinely appointed ruler of the one chosen by God to be the final judge of every single one of us, the one destined to rule on the throne of heaven forever, the one to whom history belongs. It is surprising then what it says in our verse, is it not? Or did you notice it as we read it? The Son of Man came not to be served, and not to judge the nations or to rule in glory, but to serve. I know we don't feel surprised by that. We're too familiar with the story, but we should be, shouldn't we? The Son of Man, the one to whom God has given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, came not to be served. Of course, that's not to say that he won't be served in the future. The Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven, and he will execute God's judgment. But before he does, he comes to serve. And not just to serve, but to serve unto the point of death. I wonder if you had been writing this verse, what you would have chosen as examples of Jesus' humility. The fact he healed the sick, maybe. The fact he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Perhaps the fact that he was born in a stable surrounded by sheep and cattle. But look at how Jesus goes on in our verse. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. His ultimate act of service wasn't to be born, but to die. His humility extends far beyond the manger in Bethlehem, all the way to the cross on Calvary. He became obedient even to the point of death. Throughout Mark 8 to 10, Jesus has been telling his disciples what that will involve. When they arrive in Jerusalem, he will be rejected by the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to be crucified. In the ancient world, crucifixion was widely regarded as the most cruel form of punishment imaginable, and therefore was reserved for only the most serious and degenerate of crimes. The execution itself was often preceded by a long process of abuse intended to further humiliate and degrade the victim. In Jesus' case, it meant being stripped before an entire cohort of Roman soldiers, being mocked, spat on, flogged within an inch of his life, and then, having had a crown of thorns pressed into his skull, finally, being taken out to be crucified. The New Bible Dictionary describes the process in detail. The condemned man was first stripped naked, laid on the ground with the crossbeam under his shoulders and his arms or hands nailed to it. This crossbar was then lifted and secured to the upright post so that the victim's feet which were then also nailed, were just clear of the ground. The main weight of the body was borne by a projecting peg, astride which the victim sat for all to see. And there the condemned man was left to die of hunger and exhaustion. I think if we had been there, we would have been sick from horror. Who could watch iron separating bone from muscle without retching and looking away? But even worse than the thorns and the nails 
as Jesus hung on the cross, he endured something far, far worse. The full weight of God's fury at the sins of the world. Uh, Did you notice in verse 38 of our reading that Jesus refers to his death as the cup that I drink? It's an image used again in chapter 14 when he prays to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, remove this cup from me. The image is taken from the Old Testament where it almost always refers to God's righteous indignation at the sinfulness of humanity. In Isaiah 51, it is called the cup of the Lord's wrath. And again in Jeremiah 25, the cup of the wine of his wrath. As Jesus hung on the cross then, he endured not only the worst that sinful man could throw at him, but drank to the dregs the cup of God's fury at human sin. The eternal son, in perfect unity with the Trinity from eternity past, was for a brief moment cut off from his father, my God, My God, why have you forsaken me? From the heights of heaven, as the eternal Son of Man, he went down to the depths of the cross. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It is a remarkable thing, isn't it? That the judge of all men would go there for the guilty. Over the last 2,000 years, Jesus' example has so shaped our values that we expect our leaders to be humble. We feel repelled by those who abuse their power for personal gain. And if someone should give even the slightest hint that they might be using their position to further their own ends, we condemn them in the strongest terms. But in the context of the first century, Jesus' words would have seemed all the more incredible. Remember, the world Mark's readers lived in was the world of imperial Rome, an age of emperors who went around calling themselves the sons of God, an age which featured Caligula and Nero amongst its leading lights. Only a few chapters earlier in Mark, we saw King Herod order the execution of John the Baptist simply to satisfy his lust and avoid looking stupid at a party. Now, we might seem to prefer our leaders a bit less bloodthirsty today, but in reality, what Jesus says in verse 42 of our reading still holds true. Those who are considered rulers of the nations still lord it over us. And our great ones exercise authority over us. This is the way of the world. Rich countries buy up every available vaccine while poorer nations are left to do without. City workers suffer depression and anxiety for failing to match up to the competitive hierarchies of corporate life. The strong prey on the weak and the poor get trampled in the rush to the top. But the Son of Man, the one whose kingdom will never fade or diminish, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It is remarkable, is it not? He had no sin of his own, yet he suffered like a criminal. He was innocent of guilt, yet he bore the wrath of God. The nations belong to him, and yet he came not with pomp and circumstance, but humility and compassion. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Is that not an amazing God to know and love in 2021? and an incredible king to belong to and be following this year. The precious condescension of the cross. But of course, we can only see the true beauty of the cross when we consider what it achieved 
And so secondly, the precious accomplishment of the cross. For even the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the word ransom comes from the word of slavery and captivity, something we should all know a little bit more about after a year spent in lockdown. But in Mark's mind, in the mind of his readers, the concept of a ransom would have evoked two separate images of imprisonment, both much more serious even than tier four restrictions. The first would have been that of the slave market. The word translated ransom was used as a technical term to refer to the purchase of a slave. In the first century, it was common for people to have to sell themselves into servitude out of desperation and poverty. Their ransom was the price of their freedom. Now, if they could raise the necessary funds, or perhaps if a relative was willing to pay for them, then they could buy back their liberty from their captor. In the Old Testament, the same rules were applied to property. Now, if someone had to sell their land or their livestock, then they could later redeem them back again if they could pay the ransom price. Now, often that involved a substantial amount of money, although in some cases, a substitute human life was required. But whatever the price was, the ransom would always be a decisive and costly liberation purchased through payment. The second picture evoked by the word ransom would have been the exodus. In the Old Testament, the language of redemption was used not only in the laws concerning slavery, but also to describe God's rescue of his own people from captivity in Egypt. In Exodus 6, verse 6, for example, he promised them, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Now, just as a slave could buy his freedom from captivity, so God liberated his people from slavery in Egypt. Now, and just as a slave had to buy his freedom with a costly ransom, so God had used a precious substitute of the life of of a Passover lamb to purchase his people's freedom. In both the marketplace and the Exodus then, a ransom referred to a redemption from captivity through a costly payment. It was the price of someone's freedom. And so by calling his death a ransom for many, Jesus was saying that his life would be the price of our freedom, the cost of our liberation, not from slavery in Egypt, but from slavery to something far, far worse, slavery to sin. The Bible tells us that since Genesis 3, when humanity first rebelled against God, the whole of mankind has been held captive in death because of God's wrath at our sin. Sin is our wrongful rejection of God's righteous rule. It is our refusal to acknowledge God as king. And his wrath is his righteous indignation at our rebellion, his just fury at our refusal to turn to him as Lord. His sentence upon our sin is death. Remember in Genesis 2, he told the man, in the day you eat of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. You will surely die. His righteous judgment on those who refuse to accept his rule is death. And so we are enslaved, held captive by God's wrath at our sin. And we can't free ourselves by claiming to be innocent. No one is good but God alone, said Jesus to the rich man in Mark 10. Nor can we be acquitted unless God's justice is satisfied. He will not tolerate any rebellion under his perfect rule. And so we are trapped, condemned to die by God's righteous judgment and powerless to escape from his verdict. We are like the demon-possessed man in Mark 5 who lived amongst the tombs, bound with shackles and chains. Wherever we look, we see the evidence, the proof of our bondage to decay. 
300,000 dead in the US, 66,000 in the UK, over a million and a half worldwide. Like prisoners, we sit in darkness and the shadow of death, bound by the chains of our sin. But the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The judge of all people came to pay the price of our redemption, to set us free from sin and death, to loosen the chains of our rebellion, to redeem our souls from the grave. On the cross, he took the penalty of God's wrath in our place at our sin. He drank the cup of God's righteous anger to the very last drop. And as our substitute, made a full and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He died our death. He purchased our freedom. He redeemed our souls and saved us in a new and better exodus, not from slavery in Egypt, but from the chains forged by our own iniquity. The language of service in our verse should remind us of the passage that we said in our liturgy, Isaiah 53, one of the most important New Exodus passages in the Bible and its description of the suffering servant. Surely he has borne our griefs, it says, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a substitute He was wounded for our transgressions. To bear our sin, he was crushed for our iniquities. To satisfy God's wrath. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. He went where we deserved to go that we might never have to go there. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Listen to what J.C. Ryle has to say in his expository thoughts on Mark. He says this, The death of Christ was no common death like the death of a martyr or other holy men. It was the public payment by an almighty representative of the debts of sinful man to a holy God. It was the ransom by which a divine surety undertook to provide in order to procure liberty for sinners tied and bound by the chains of their sins. By that death, Jesus made a full and complete satisfaction for man's countless transgressions. He bore our sin in his own body on the tree. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. When he died, he died for us. When he suffered, he suffered in our stead. When he hung on the cross, he hung there as our substitute, when his blood flowed, it was the price of our souls. What an incredible saviour to be following this year. The one who went to those depths to set us free. And what an incredible hope we can have as we look forward into the future. Though we continue to live in this fallen world in broken bodies which get sick and grow old, yet we can know that we have been saved from sin and redeemed from the grave. If you belong to Jesus, then free forgiveness and peace with God are yours already. Every sin 
has been wiped away. And so you can sing with confidence, my chains are gone. I've been set free for God, my savior, ransomed me. And as we look forward to the future, we can have confidence that he will come again on the clouds of heaven, not to execute judgment on those covered by his blood, but to transform our lowly bodies and make them like his glorious body. In a world of guilt, we can know forgiveness. In a world of anxiety, we can know peace. In a world of grief, we can have hope and life. When all else fails, here is solid ground for our feet in 2021. And where everywhere else we look, we see sickness and disease. Here is tonic for our souls. The precious accomplishment of the cross. And finally, the precious accessibility of the cross. For even the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, or as Paul says it in 1 Timothy 2, as a ransom on behalf of all. Whoever you are then, and wherever you come from, this ransom is for you. No one too bad, no one too sinful, no one too far gone. All are welcome at the foot of the cross. At whatever kind of Christmas you had, however badly you feel you might have messed up, however far you seem to have drifted, there is forgiveness for you here. Everything you need is in him. And all you have to bring is your sin. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How then does this help us at the beginning of a new year? Well, let me draw out three brief things as we come to a close. First, it gives us a priceless gift, a far more precious than any vaccine or return to normality, is the cross of the Lord Jesus and the freedom which we have in him. Uh, it might be that you're here this evening and you haven't yet received that gift. Well, can I encourage you to make this year the year Indeed, to make this night the night. Accept what Jesus says in Mark 10, verse 27, that with man, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. We are enslaved by his sentence of death upon our sin. But the Son of Man came to pay the ransom. He died your death in your place that you might live for him. Accept that gift. Receive his ransom and come to him as a child with nothing to offer and everything to gain. Or if you've already done that, which I expect is most of us here this evening, then why not do it again at the start of this new year? In fact, do it daily. A resolve to start each new morning in 2021 here at the foot of the cross. And however hopeless the world around us becomes, allow yourself to be renewed continually with thankfulness for his sacrifice in this year. It gives us a priceless gift. Secondly, it gives us a perfect example. In verse 44, 44 of our reading, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. It is a curious paradox, isn't it? He's about to tell them that his death will purchase their freedom, and yet he tells them to live as slaves. For freedom, they have been set free, but not to use their freedom for themselves. Rather, they are to serve one another in humility 
and love. And do they not have an exquisite example in him, the Son of Man, who condescended to Calvary to bring them out of darkness and the shadow of death? That is a message we need in 2021, is it not? And when service requires more effort and sometimes even a risk to our health, and when fellowship becomes just another night in front of the screen, and when you could just have the night off and stay at home, remember the Son of Man who came not to be served but to serve, who became last of all and servant of all and gave his life as a ransom for many. When it feels hard to serve this year, look to him. Look to what it cost him and where he went for us and follow him even to the end. It gives us a perfect example. And finally, it gives us a precious treasure. For here is a pearl of great price to store up in your heart this year, to meditate over day and night and to gaze on Whenever you need reminding, and you will need reminding, of why we follow Christ as King. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me lead us in a final prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you that we can follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he has ransomed us from sin and death and is leading us into his perfect kingdom. Help us this year to follow him, to receive his perfect sacrifice and to imitate his glorious service as we seek to walk on his path in this new year. In Jesus' name. Amen.